few first minutes we usually let people trickle in double check that the services are up and running uh, so we do go live on LinkedIn, YouTube, Twitch, and uh, Facebook. Um, but yeah, the first couple of minutes, like I said, just making sure that everything looks good. I see us on YouTube. I, I see us on LinkedIn. And what, while we're letting everyone get in here, we absolutely should uh, welcome everyone to this special episode with Adam on the Super Happy Star Trek Day. Is Something there like some is, is there some like nerdy Star Trek reference we should make uh, for everyone about Star Trek Day, or is it just Star Trek Day, Adam? Oh, it's just Star Trek Day. It's okay. you know how how the spirit of Star Trek moves you. It's a Star Trek Day, you know. <laughs> Perfect. No, so so happy uh, happy Star Trek Day to uh, to everyone. Give us some sort of I don't know emoji in the chat. Uh, is is there Star Trek emojis? Do Star Trek emojis exist, Adam? Oh, I'm sure you could get. I think they have this one. I think that's a tough one. I would imagine. I, yeah. I would imagine that they have that as well. No, but but very good. So, um, as we welcome everyone in, uh, one of my favorite parts about the community comments, Adam, is we get to embarrass Vlad. So, as you may or may not know, uh, Solus PLC has almost twenty four thousand uh, YouTube subscribers at this moment. That I suppose we are technically streaming live to at the moment. Hey. Uh, all, all the YouTube folks, uh, we're in we're in the race for that silver play button over Vlad's right shoulder. I think that's what the set <laughs> needs. We've got you know a quarter of a million dollars with the PLCs, and we need a silver play button. So we're asking everyone to go through and hit that uh, subscribe button on YouTube if you have not already. Um, beyond Thanks, that, uh, I'm I'm doing my best, Vlad. I'm doing my best. Uh, so beyond that. Um, as we've, we've talked about the last couple of weeks, Preston Hadley at Envisions, uh, Envisions.io has his Change of Life giveaway that he has going on. It's for a Siemens S7-1500, a servo kit, uh, some TIA portal software. And that is running through the entire month of September into October. Um, and then we'll go ahead and drop links in the chat for that. Um, our one comment about that is if you guys are kind of mid-career, please allow someone who is early in their career to go ahead and, uh, and win some of that hardware. Um, and then beyond that, we've got a super special announcement. Thanks to Adam and the folks at Copia. Um, they are sponsoring the theme this month. Um, yeah, you guys are sponsoring the theme this month, uh, DevOps and Industrial Automation. I think it's a very exciting theme, as I've told Adam. I think every time we've been on a conversation since the beginning of the year, uh, I think it's, it's very exciting. So we have dropped the link in the chat if you guys are interested in a free trial of the software that they're using. Uh, go ahead and uh, go ahead and click that link. And Matt and Cody and Adam and the the team over there will uh, will take care of you. Um, I. That is, uh, the, and then one last comment is we are still going live every week, six o'clock East Coast time on Wednesdays, and you guys can catch all of our podcasts at manufacturinghub.live. Um, I think I've chatted myself out to start this, Vlad. Do you have any other thoughts before we jump in? No, I think you covered it very well, Dave. Do you want to introduce our guest as well as the episode? Absolutely. Uh, everyone, welcome to episode 28 of the Manufacturing Hub with me, Dave, and this guy down here, Vlad. We have a very special guest this week, Adam Gluck. Adam is the co-founder and CEO of Copia Automation. And this week, we're going to talk about DevOps and industrial automation. Uh, welcome aboard, Adam. Hey, yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, super excited to be here. Uh, of course, of course. So, before we jump into your background and how you went from Uber to getting into industrial automation, can you tell us all, anyone who may not know a little bit more about what DevOps is and how it relates to the industrial automation space, please? Yeah, so DevOps is short for developer operations, um, DevOps. Uh, it kind of came into existence in, in the, the IT space. And, and basically the, the core idea is, you know, putting processes in place for change management, how you manage your code, basically all the stuff that you need to operate a dev team. So all those sorts of operations. Um, typically, you know, when I talk about DevOps, I, I often refer to kind of four um, kind of four pillars and, and these processes exist, whether you're deploying code to operational technology, IT technology, whatever, any situation you're deploying code, and really those four pillars look like, you know, uh, source control. So how you manage your files, the sharing of your files, all of that stuff. 
um, testing. So how you actually test your code, and that can be you know manual testing, a QA to um, automated testing, integration tests, simulations, all that. But testing is kind of a, a set of processes that engineers do to, to make sure to safely deploy their code. Then deployment in itself. So how you actually manage the change. So how you actually deploy your code and, and put it into production. And then finally, uh, observability, which is broadly monitoring and alerting. So you know in the OT space, that'd be SCADA, you know, or, or any sort of uh, kind of monitoring solution that's out there that that takes information off of a, a manufacturing floor and and, and uh, you know lets you understand what's happening better. Um, in the case of DevOps, it's really very specifically tied to the, to the idea of uptime. So, you know, did you push a regress or not, rather than, you know, a lot of industry 4.0 is tied to optimization and, and that sort of thing. How do you actually, you know, use data to drive insights to improve your processes? Really, you know, uh, when you're talking about observability and DevOps sense, it's really like, is this broken or not? Yes or no? You know, you're trying to answer that question as, as quickly as possible and, and mitigate if there's an issue. So those are kind of the four pillars there. And, and that's typically exists in the IT space. What we've seen is a lot of companies, um, even in the the OT space have started to adopt the same practices. Um, and then obviously where Copia comes in is, is building tools to, to support those processes. And, you know, I can talk more about, you know, what that looks like, but really it's tied to, you know, get based source control, making testing as automated as possible, having a really eloquent deployment model for pushing changes and then integrating with, with those existing kind of observability platforms that are out there to more quickly capture issues and, and mitigate issues in, in production. If I may, I guess, kind of summarize or simplify it also, because I think, you know, software or traditional software development has been using DevOps for a while now, right? As you mentioned, IT has been using it. But I think in manufacturing, a lot of the folks are still not as, I would say, comfortable going into that space, especially if you're like pure controls or your process engineering. And so I guess it's important to also realize, you know, for you, the benefits are time saved in development, time saved in, let's say, when you're doing code changes. And ultimately, it makes it, I think, easier to deploy some of those changes or, you know, the requests that you might get from management. Well, let's develop this new line. Let's develop this new process. So is there any other maybe like advantages that you can kind of boil down to maybe business level uh, type of savings? Yeah, so I mean, I think it's kind of interesting because I spent years uh, pushing for DevOps tools internally at Uber. And I always say that like it really, anytime you look at it, it really boils down to two benefits. <laughs> like that's really all the benefits you get from this. One is productivity for engineers. And then two is uptime. And like, there's a million ways you end up attacking those problems and that you can like increasingly, you know, improve uptime and increasingly improve productivity. And then you can actually get more orders of magnitude improvement, you know, once you get increasingly automated systems, but it's really always those two benefits. And obviously those tie into, you know, ROI for um, productivity is kind of twofold. One is like, you know, pure time save. So you're doing more with less. So, you know, your same engineering team can produce more and that's actually pure strategic value. If you can bring a product to market faster, you know, if you can hit your milestones better, if your projects aren't behind, you actually just producing revenue for the company, but then also purely like, you know, the cost of, of engineering time. So if you're, you're saving um, people time, you know, you can do more with that time. So really those are the two kind of like benefits from an ROI perspective for productivity. And then I'd say uptime, I mean, that's super clear, right? So, I mean, and I think really it comes across two dimensions. Once again, one is, you know, planned downtime and unplanned downtime. So one is, you know, can you more quickly reduce your planned downtime because you can test your code more easily. You've had more review before you go into production, that sort of thing. Um, two uh, is really, Really, um, and also, you know, obviously, if you're able to migrate machines more easily, that sort of thing, you're reducing planned downtime. Two is unplanned downtime, right? So if you can capture issues more quickly um, and mitigate them, because you, for example, have good source control practices, you can root cause issues more quickly. You know, you're saving a lot of money, and the order magnitude of that can be, you know, two two hundred fifty thousand dollars per average across all industrial verticals, or twenty two thousand dollars per minute. If you're looking at more uh, as some verticals like automotive, right? So you can get very very expensive to have uh, unplanned downtime, as, as a lot of people know. And I think also in the industrial space, there's probably a third benefit, which you don't talk about as much in IT, which is just safety. Um, so obviously, you know, having a lot of checks and, pro and processes in place to make the code deployment more stable is it has a huge safety benefit. So um, I, I think really, you know, in IT, maybe there's two benefits and in OT, I think there's probably, you know, three benefits you could, you could keep pulling it down to. Yeah, I like that. I guess I haven't, um, you know, safety doesn't automatically come to mind. So I, I appreciate you pointing that out. But um, no, I want to, I guess, like, Dave kind of skipped that portion. And he did mention that would go back to uh, your background, because I think you have a, I would, based on your profile, a very non traditional education to be in the space. So I want you, I guess, to give us maybe an overview, and then we can kind of dive a little bit deeper on how uh, you got into manufacturing specifically. 
Yeah, so I mean, my background, uh, you know, as you mentioned, was in the IT space, uh, I guess, as one would say. So I was, you know, a traditional tech company. So I was at Uber. Um, I joined there. And really, the reason I kind of joined Uber originally, as I was talking to someone about this earlier today, is uh, like, uh, there's this phrase we use, Uber bits and atoms. Um, so it's like, you know, you're using, you know, software to move things in the real world. Um, and so to me, that's always been really exciting. So how do you drive more productivity with software? Automation has always been the back of my mind um, from that perspective. Um, and so I was often looking into ideas in kind of the automation space, kind of like looking into it, but I, I didn't actually go into it. So um, basically I was like, for, for the last you know, two and a half years that I was at Uber, I was actually looking into like, how do I build a factory? And I had this whole thesis about like a highly automated factory, you know, and all this stuff. And I actually stumbled across PLCs. I mean, my background at Uber had been that I joined when there was basically four engineers on the driver product team. So we're building out the app that drivers used. Um, and then we grew to 200. So I built out all the DevOps processes and actually formed a team called Driver Platform. Eventually had 10 engineers on it where we were actually just building out all the processes and all the core architecture for the driver app that we were shipping to millions of drivers every month. And then mm -hmm. I switched over and worked on engineering strategy at Uber, which is really like, how does Uber globally, you know, operate <laughs> as an organization? You know, so we were thinking about DevOps. Also, like, how do you make broad changes across an organization? How do you do migrations? And then also how do our overall micro, uh, microservice architecture work? So all of that was happening in the foreground. And in the background, I was like, hey, how do I build a factory? And then I stumbled across PLCs as a technology. I'm like, hey, there's maybe an interesting intersection here of like, how do we take this kind of DevOps technology that seems really standard when we're like deploying you know, code that it doesn't really matter oftentimes if it goes down. And then you're deploying code against the manufacturing line where like, you know, someone could be hurt. You know, you could lose, you know, millions of dollars. <laughs> you know, it's like a multi-million dollar equipment. Like so much can go wrong. And then it's like, oh, well, those same processes aren't there. And they seem like they'd be useful. Um, from there, I kind of had this moment where I'm like, well, this seems like an idea my brain generated. That, that's interesting. You know, why don't I go talk to people? Um, and then I have, I have family from Michigan. Um, they were able to introduce me to some people in the manufacturing space. Um, and so I started talking to people that way, also through my network. And, you know, of the first five companies I talked to, probably three or four were like, yeah, this seems useful. We actually know about these solutions already and we're confused why they're not there. So if you can build this, we'd work with you. <laughs> and so it seemed easy to start to kind of form a company from there. And so I was able to kind of connect my, my sets of interests and skills. And I was like, here's an area where I can actually be high leverage to, to add value to a to a space so were you purely like interested in manufacturing was it because you knew the field well enough and i guess the lack of uh, of these tools that there is a gap you know of something that you've worked on at uber that might be able to fill a same uh type of void that you signed manufacturing yeah, so i guess so like the question is sorry why like why the interest in manufacturing based on what you were doing at uber yeah. So, I mean, it wasn't based, like, I would say more like my broad interest in productivity, like the way that we actually like drive core productivity within like, you know, different pieces of infrastructure. So Uber is obviously transportation play mm -hmm. and much more so when I joined Uber. So now you think of Uber as like, you know, drivers and you think of it as eats, you know, but like when I joined Uber in 2014, it was like, how do we build, you know, a dispatch system that can move anything anywhere in any city? You know, that was like kind of the big question. That was the architectural questions I was really interested in. You know what I mean? And then when I look at manufacturing, it's like, well, how do we like build a highly automated industrial base. If you look at efficiency in automation, or sorry, efficiency in, in manufacturing in the 2010s in the US, it was pretty flat in a lot of places. So it's like, well, hey, how do we drive that kind of efficiency improvement and actually like fundamentally rebuild our industrial base? And, you know, today's Star Trek day, so I'll bring this up as well, which is like, I'm very obsessed with that idea for like kind of a post-scarcity society as well. Like, how do we get to the point where we can really produce the goods that everyone needs? I think that starts at the industrial base and really starts with automation. So for my like science fiction brain as well, <laughs> you know, this is the sort of technology that's only always kind of captured me and I just didn't have the background for it. So I slowly kind of like worked my way into it that way. But there is always this thread of like, how do I drive, you know, some sort of productivity improvement through writing code? How do I drive kind of fundamental changes in, in these kind of core pieces of infrastructure, you know, and, and, and automation became an area that I was paying attention to a lot over a, over a five year period as I started to look into these different things. Yeah, that um, that definitely makes sense. I, I, I'm curious your thoughts on, you know, how the manufacturing industry will evolve uh, with the introduction of these tools right so obviously we all talk about industry 4.0 i think there's a lot more data plays coming in but how do you see maybe from an engineering standpoint you know and we've asked this question a couple of times before but do you see more software engineers entering manufacturing and then let's say bridging the gap more on the process side and trying to understand controls or do you see controls engineers trying to learn some of these traditionally more like IT and software tools? Like what are your thoughts on like the change in the landscape? 
Yeah, I mean, I think that I see some some merging of disciplines, obviously, um, you know, as, as part of where I sit on it, but there's still like so much, so much complexity to the way that controls works, you know what I mean? Like, you know, controls engineers are not only software engineers, but they're electrical engineers, mechanical engineers, process engineers, you know, they, they understand, you know, a lot of a lot of really, really hard topics that like the typical software engineer doesn't. I think it'd be like easier to turn a controls engineer into a software engineer than a software engineer into a controls engineer, because like a lot of software engineers are missing the kind of like deep electrical engineering background. So in that way, I find controls engineering really compelling. And I think there's a lot of stuff that's happening there that make it hard to just like transform a software engineer into a controls engineer. But I do see more bleeding of the disciplines and I'd like to see them come together a little bit more and make it possible for controls engineers to take tools out of the software world to kind of enable the kind of hard problems that they need to solve or enable solutions to the hard problems that they have to solve. Um, so that's how I'd look at it. as far as where I see things going. I think we're actually in a really exciting time. And Dave and I were talking about this yesterday mm -hmm. uh, in kind of a lot of detail. And I'm actually, honestly, I've been working on this for two years. And it's kind of funny because it's like you work on these sorts of projects and you just say the same thing over and over and over again. So you're like often repeating yourself, you know, and I was like kind of almost struck me two or three weeks ago that, that like suddenly it's just gotten really, really exciting. Like I was always very excited about it, but I feel very, very excited right now. And because I just think there's a lot of tailwinds that are driving like the need for increase in productivity for controls engineers, because what we're seeing is obviously everyone's super slammed right now, like every manufacturer that we talk to, it's like 60 hours a week, <laughs> you know, controls engineers are really working hard right now, it's probably because we're going to manufacturing boom, but also because we can't backfill jobs and manufacturing people are leaning on automation more. So controls engineers are seeing their salaries go up. They're more desirable. You know, they have more autonomy within their jobs. They can actually kind of own the sort of tools that they want to work on. And we have to do more, more with less. But even two years ago when I started, everyone was like, well, I have an archive folder. I don't need Git. It's good enough. I was like, eh, yeah, maybe for your organization it is. There's very few organizations now where like you can't invest in productivity to some degree. And so I think these sorts of tools are really going to start to drive a transformation, but it's partly because of that, that sort of tailwind there. Dave, I, I want to give you an opportunity to ask a question as well. What are your thoughts on on that? Absolutely. So I agree with everything. I agree with everything that Adam has been saying, and uh, and, and to that point, uh, he and I were, were chatting yesterday, and and he brought up a very interesting topic that even before this, I thought was worth kind of repeating. You know, in many large organizations, if you run across a problem, historically, it's a we'll just throw twenty controls engineers at it, or twenty engineers of any sort at it, and we have gotten to a point in the last this year or so where there just aren't twenty more to have. And so we, we have to go and look at tools and processes to help streamline the workflow and make the best decisions humanly possible. And so I think it's a very exciting time uh, for all of the reasons that, uh, that <clears throat> excuse me, that Adam uh, had mentioned. And I, and I think that it will be, it'll be, yeah, I think it's a very exciting time. Um, and then kind of to that point, can we talk a little bit, you, you mentioned a little bit about Git for PLCs, Adam, can we talk about what you've spent a lot of the last, you know, year and a half or two years building and why you decided to start kind of building DevOps in that, in that way from that point? Yeah, so, you know, it's kind of funny because it's like from day one, our strategy was like, let's start with Git based source control. Um, and we went through like a few different iterations. So probably in the first year, we went through like four different code bases uh, to get to something that we thought was was a good implementation of this. The reason we start with Git-based source control is one, it's just like super simple. So I was like, what's the, the biggest entry point? And like, you know, we talked about my experience at Uber on engineering strategy. Well, you know, you talk about, um, you know, making changes broadly in an organization. And I often say the cost of R&D is a lot, a lot less than the cost of, of migration. So, you know, we raise money for a startup, you know, it's like, great, we have money in the bank. You know, if, if I went to, you know, Ford and told them to shut down their F-150 line for a day, the revenue they'd lose out on would be, you know, greater than, you know, what the you know entire funding of our company has been throughout its life cycle, right? So you start looking at that and you're like, well, you can't really introduce a solution that asks people to like shut things down. So you kind of need to retrofit. Um, and then like also people are super, super busy. So if you're gonna introduce someone to a concept like DevOps, you know, you don't wanna be like, hey, you're gonna have to go through an insane learning curve and you have to do all this work to reconfigure your systems because people aren't gonna take that bet unless they immediately see a lot of benefit. So for me, I was like, okay, you know what? Like let's find a solution that's really easy for people to adopt. Um, and that they can just migrate to in 10 minutes. And that was Git, right? And then on top of that, you get a bunch of benefit with Git. So that was one I thought from a, an entry point to organization perspective, this is the best entry point for the space for people to actually start to familiarize with themselves and start to optimize these processes. But two, um, it's also actually kind of interesting and maybe convenient that uh, the entire DevOps tool chain is dependent on good source control practices. 
So, you know, if you're not checking code consistently with source control and you have an automated test suite that runs every time you check code into source control, that automated <laughs> test suite isn't going to run, right? If you want to have a deployment model where you can roll in and roll out code, if there's a regression, you know, once again, uh, you know, that sort of, uh, you know, um, not having code, you know, last good version, it's not going to work, right? If you want to have observability and tie it to code changes, you know, over time. Well, once again, if you don't have good source control, so you start to get to a point where it's like you actually need that to get any of the rest of the solution to work. So it's both the easiest thing for people to adopt to just get going, but also opens up a whole space of solutions um, on top of that that source control. Um, so on, on top of those source files. So that's kind of why we start with Git. Um, and, and I think it's been, it's been pretty effective because we've definitely seen engineering organizations pick it up pretty, pretty quickly. And I think to me, what makes a lot of sense, uh, like one of the points that you mentioned is critical in manufacturing, right? It's not shutting down your process. Cause I think, you know, having been in the field, I've seen where you can't even make the slightest change that would bring the process down. And as you said, it can be very easily tied to dollars right at that point. And so if it's not going to benefit you in that same amount, you're obviously not not willing to take that risk. So I think that's yeah. an important um, entry point for sure. Yeah, also like broadly, like I'm pretty lazy when it comes to adopting new tools. <laughs> so anything that has like high cognitive overhead for me to get any value out of, I'm like, I'm not gonna sit there and like go through like five days of training to learn how to use a tool. But like the nice thing about Git is you can sit someone down and work them through the workflow in 10 minutes, you know, 15 minutes, and they'll get some value out of it. And every tool that I've liked, I can immediately get to that sort of aha moment, I guess they say in product development. Um, and so I wanted to also introduce a tool that's like, yeah, people can just like start using this and they get value out of it. And it's not a, you know, a pain for them. So um, that was a big thing as well. How do you plan on tackling, you know, speaking of that challenge, right? Because I'm assuming, again, based on any tool I think we introduce in manufacturing, there's always that same old pushback where someone on the plant floor is either not capable or not willing or doesn't have the time to learn whatever. Um, like, how are you planning on training people on, again, I think on proven tools that have seen benefits in other industries that are just maybe not as, I would say, um, as someone would see in manufacturing, right? Because you, you do have, I guess, certain version controls that are not that great, but I'm not gonna name the companies, but there are certain solutions out there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think like training is something that comes up consistently and it's something we're like gonna continue to invest in a bunch of different ways. The one thing I think like the minimum we can do, and we actually did this like on day, actually before we even shipped our beta product, I put together a tutorial re repository in our product. So like as soon as people jump in, they would be like, here are at least the minimum steps and putting documentation together. Um, but for us, I think that's like something we need to keep fleshing out. What we often see though is like the basic workflow is straightforward. So we get people just doing that. And then once you're in the tool, you start to explore. And so we've seen teams almost always go through this curve of like, like, hey, we're gonna just commit and push code, which is the basic Git workflow. And then we'll go out from, from thing to thing. But yeah, to your point, training is always a big challenge. And like one thing that we've heard from, from people that we're, we wanna invest in soon um, slash are already starting to invest in is like, hey, we have engineers who, who aren't gonna do all this process. Like they're just gonna, no matter what, deploy code against a, a PLC, because that's what they've done forever, but we still wanna use source control and we don't think we can get the team on board. Can you do auto backup? Right. And that sort of thing. So we can start to actually pull code off of PLC. So, you know, being able to work with people and meet people where they're at, as opposed to being like, here's my idea of how the world operates. I'm going to try and push that on everyone right away. Instead of being like, well, hey, can we put something in place? Like, we'll just create, a, it's called a pull request and, and get, you might be familiar with it, but, you know, it's but like you'd create pull it pull off request. the hardware, off the actual, like, so you'd put in like the IP address of your PLCs and then be able to automatically kind of check up on what's going on. Yeah, that's, that, really that's cool. one of the next features we want to build. Um, and exactly for this reason, because it's like, how do you meet people where they're at? And people are like, hey, we're not going to train a team to do this. But if you can build that, that's great. We're happy to start using it. So, you know, those sorts of things start to look like solutions that are that, that drive value in the space. And so I very much always have a philosophy of like meet people where they're at. You know what I mean? Um, and I think like investing in that and understanding like what the actual literal existing process is. And then going ahead and, and saying, okay, well, let, let's, you know, uh, just try and come as close to as possible is really like my core philosophy on this. And then over time, hopefully you're building something that adds value and then people see the value and they adopt that. I don't think you ever win anything by, by being pedantic and, and forcing people to do things in a particular way, I, or at least I don't operate that way as a person. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think that like solution alone, right? Like you mentioned the feature that's coming up, it's really cool, right? Because again, having seen what happens in the real manufacturing environments, um, the answer that you often get whenever a PLC goes down. And as you may know, they sometimes lose their program, right? Because somebody switched the wrong push button or whatever. And then 
someone on a laptop has this program stored and so you have to hunt that person down get them back into the plant and then load the program back on the on the plc right so at the very yeah. least you're going to immediately win over that uh that one issue right that could occur with uh with your program so yeah i mean code observability is like a really big thing <laughs> it's actually funny because i like was trying to explain this solution to someone i'm like well you know a lot of times people don't even know what code is running on the manufacturing floor. And someone's like, really? And I'm like, yeah, I'm like, how would you? You know what I mean? Like, unless you have the, the right practices in place. So I think just even that core code observability, I mean, there's so many benefits that you get as you start to adopt a system like this. And it's kind of funny because like, I always want to be like, here's the one bullet. And sometimes if you're selling like, you know, widget line that produces widgets twice, twice as fast, it's really easy to map to ROI. But sometimes with our product, the challenge is like, here's 15 things that are a little bit painful for you. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> and like, this actually fixes all of them. You know, you have to kind of lay them out and then it, you realize that it's actually kind of a high cost on your organization, right? But it's not always like immediately apparent. So like what you're describing is like, yeah, sometimes you just don't know what codes were running <laughs> on the manufacturing floor. You have to bring someone in and you're like used to doing that. But then like, oh, if you could not do that, <laughs> it'd be great, <laughs> you know? Um, yeah, and hopefully it brings the, the better, the best practices, right? Like from the software world back into manufacturing. Because I think, like as people are using these tools they will realize what makes sense what doesn't make sense right well in the past we've never really backed up anything now we have a tool that like constantly backs it up well we should also probably back it up at some point like manually or whatever right so it brings back some of the concepts that have been again developed for a reason in uh, in software because things go wrong you get you know, we talked about this with uh, on the last episode where you know things can get updated or windows gets updated or your containers get updated so a lot of things can go wrong in the process and so having like just something as simple as a backup is crucial but again we talk about it and everyone seems to know it but in the real world it doesn't seem to happen so yeah. And I get that people have a lot on their plate, you know, <laughs> like I'm like a realist, you know? So it's like kind of funny where it's like, we actually have on our website, like not a revolution, just common sense, you know, cause our whole point is like, we're not coming in here and being like, Hey, let's like change. I mean, I think we will like create a huge amount of value. So don't get me wrong. But I think that value is actually through a lot of common sense practices, things that like just make sense to do. And you're like, yeah, if you hear it, you're like, we should be doing that. And then it all adds up together to like a really useful system. You know, we build the tools to support that. But like, to me, I don't want to come in and be like, I'm in a revolution you know all these different things for people i'm like no like people have a lot on their plate let's build useful tools that solve real problems and then you know from there hopefully we start to see some really cool you know emergent strat strategic you know solutions for people you know over time yeah absolutely um so we have a question on on linkedin uh from chris over here he's wondering if it's proprietary because so can you kind of go a little bit deeper and explain what you've built on top of the, the gift foundations adam please yeah, so Git is open source. I and mean, I actually have had someone ask me that, like, do you feel, you know, unsafe building on open source technology? And Git is like, as me, it's like saying we build on Linux, you know, which is like what all EC2 is, like all AWS is actually the, the maker of Linux, Linus Trivold wrote wrote git uh it was like his project actually it was it's an interesting story anyway that we could get into about him like uh like feeling like insecure at some point i think there's like there's some stories like feeling kind of insecure so he like built it to prove to himself that he could build this sort of solution anyway uh so it's a cool engineering story but uh basically uh you know so he built out git and then you know millions of people use git every day so it's a very standard based solution and it's open source and and you know google facebook uh, you know Amazon, lots of engineering organizations, by the way, you know, manufacturing organizations use Git already to store their source files, you know, um, so part of our solution is obviously that better layer of support for industrial file types, but, you know, Git is very, very standard, you know, almost every organization we sell to their IT department already uses it. Um, and then uh, on top of that, you know, from there, like the proprietary pieces of this is like we're often building on top of the kind of XML or, or APIs that are increasingly coming into existence within industrial um, technologies. And basically every single industrial manufacturer now has an XML export that you can access um, that describes their, their source file. So, you know, Rockwell, it's the L5X file type, dot export for Codasys, openness API, for um, you know Siemens, you can go through. Everyone is doing this at this point. I think part of it's that we've seen so much competition in the, the IPC and DLC space that people have been kind of forced to open up their platforms more. And so these sorts of tools have just even recently become possible. But we're building on top of that sort of like well-supported, you know, um, XML layer for all of our Git rendering and, and all of that stuff. Um, and then we do some conversion under the hood if we get a, a binary file type, which is also um, um, well-supported in these cases. 
Do you see the manufacturing yeah. space in general going uh, more open source? And I guess, like, what are your thoughts on that? Because I think, like, software is certainly headed that way, in uh, in my opinion. And uh, I think we're seeing that trickle into manufacturing. But as you know, a lot of the OEMs certainly have not uh, released any of their proprietary software and, and hardware, for that matter. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely like some projects out there that are interested in like open PLC, you know, mm -hmm. which has kind of come out of like, how do you how do you do that? So that that's interesting to me. I think like the first thing that will happen at least, and I, I think we have definitely seen this is like the platforms have started to open up. So mm -hmm. like, you know, like Codis has a bunch of APIs, you know, Siemens has a bunch of APIs. There's ways of different accessing a lot of the stuff that Rockwell does as well at this point. So like there are kind of like this, this, this tendency towards starting to open up. Um, within each of these different vendor verticals, which is like very exciting to me. So I think that, and I think that's a product of, of competition, honestly. I think it's like, you have so many different PLC manufacturers and then you have like the IPC people who came and they were kind of pitching openness and they'll kind of pitch when they go and sell to people that, you know, you can build all this great stuff on top of our platforms. And that's forced everyone to get a little bit more open as a result of that. And I think we're gonna see more and more of that within these different, you know, kind of hardware producers that they're just gonna have to do it in order to compete. You know, especially as you look at like very advanced manufacturers who are spending a ton of money with them they want to build custom solutions on top of these so i think that part will open up now do i think like an open source model will start to exist in plc programming interesting question i think it's possible but i think there's like some prerequisite steps and i think we're starting to see those as well first of all it's just like getting to a point where reusable code is very standard in a lot of manufacturing environments and this is actually another exciting piece and you're asking like what i think devops will support we can talk about this more i think we're seeing a lot of you know uh, manufacturers um you know and advanced or not advanced you know we see two person you know si's where they'll build reusable code libraries now or standard uh, master builds we'll see 50 person organizations where they'll build reusable aois that sort of thing as well so we see it all over the place now that people are starting to invest in reusability of code to increase their productivity and once that gets heavy investment some of that reusable code we're going to see cross organizationally everyone's writing separately the same libraries and there might be some benefit for people to open source that and so that's what happened in software a little bit um, outside just the community of people being excited about building solutions was also corporate companies realized that they could publish solutions that then became ubiquitous and people would join their companies just to use that so if we see increase in demand for controls engineers and we see you know increase in reusable code across different manufacturers and some of that code starts to look standard for example i think a lot of people build the same drivers at every company you know we might see really advanced SIs where like you know what we're going to open source our drivers because like everyone's writing this code anyway and then we can show that we're kind of beneficial there we, we have them we've seen oems too who do this as well where they're actually starting to embrace an open source model for their drivers and whatnot because then they can get also if they're a smaller oem they can get um plc engineers to actually write code for them for free so like you get that benefit as well so there's a lot of reasons like actually incentives that lead to the adoption of open source i don't see why those incentives couldn't come into play within plc programming and i think we see there's some scent of it in the air that it could happen but it's one of those things where it's like do we drive in the right way or not and, and do those incentives continue to happen but if we see increased demand for controls engineers we see increased in reusability of code i think we'll start to see some open source solutions out there yeah, that's uh that's an interesting thought. You know, I haven't uh, really given it much thought of my own, but even again in Fortune 500 companies, very large manufacturers, you would see engineers developing their own libraries from plant to plant, right? And even a lot of times, even at one plant where you have five engineers, let's say on the control side, each one would develop their own drivers, their own set of tools, and there wouldn't be necessarily that much sharing because, again, I think the OEMs don't inherently make it easy to share some of those libraries, right? Like they're not like software. Again, uh, you know, if we talk about good base solutions, like you can very easily spin off a repository and send any piece of code that you want, but in let's say Rockwell, Siemens, what have you, I don't think it's as easy to share. And I think they're slowly catch, catching on and making changes, but it's not there yet. So I, I could definitely yeah. see, you know, within an organization, I think it's gonna be an immediate benefit. Um, outside of organizations, I think it's gonna be really interesting because you're going to see probably like marketplaces, right? That you would see uh, in other tools where anyone could develop a certain library, and um, right now, I don't think there's even anything for, you know, that I know of for like Rockwell or Siemens. I think they have their own libraries that they uh, that you can go and download, but there's no like community based uh, per se repository for for code. So, yeah, that, I think that's yeah. going to be very I interesting. 
it's definitely a feature request that we've gotten from engineers who are like, hey, we're collaborating. And like, it's something I want to enable at some point. You could probably do it on our platform. Like someone has an open source project that they want to incubate, like reach out to me. We can like get you some licenses and help mm -hmm. you build a community, you know, like a, an org or something like that. Like very happy to, to collaborate on that, you know. And it, But eventually I think we could get to a point where we say, here's an open source repository and at least experiment with that. But we need kind of those initial bit of market partners and that sort of thing. And it's a, it's a big investment um, on our end to, to support all that. But I think it's one of those things where it's like i think it's a direction things could go and i think it'd be really exciting and i think there's a bunch of reasons why i come into existence the other thing i think will be interesting is like can oems figure out like a strategy around it and why it's beneficial like one of the biggest benefits of like an open source strategy is like if you have some some core software or something that you're running you know you can get you know a bunch of engineers to work on it <laughs> you don't have to hire them you can get free labor and, and result for free and, and trade for free code so you know getting that sort of strategy or it helps with hiring or that sort of thing so i, I think it'll be interesting to see how this evolves but i think it's possible <laughs> is what I yeah, would say. and I mean, ultimately, for, for the OEMs, it helps their clients, right? Like, because it saves time, again, on development, it saves, like, error code that could be potentially be deployed in your production facility. So it makes it easier for, for everyone. I think there's also this, like, no code movement that's slowly coming out. So I think with those libraries, it's going to be a lot easier to even create a solution of that nature in manufacturing, right? Where, for example, someone who knows the process extremely well, but maybe not as proficient with software can just drop blocks of code. And we see that with something like Node-RED, right? Where you don't necessarily need to code. Obviously, you have that capability, but you can easily drop blocks of code that have been pre-developed, um, usually in open source, and um, get a full solution up and running pretty quickly. So... Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, for sure. I'm so excited. Like I very much hope we, we get there. I hope we get there even within large organizations as a first step, you know, that people aren't rewriting the same code every time, but like eventually, you know, and I think we were moving in that way. Um, but like, yeah, eventually I hope we get to the point where it's like, Hey, you know, you start a project, you have a bunch of solutions online you can start with. And then, you know, within your organization, you have libraries and, and you're building up these, these PLCs much more quickly. And then people are writing more and more interesting logic. You know, that's, that's the benefit of this is you're not rewriting the same thing over and over again you actually get to do the most interesting part of your job most of the time as yeah. opposed to writing a driver for something you've been a driver for like 17 times you know <laughs> no exactly absolutely 100 no, percent. no i i i agree with you guys as well so adam uh i think we've talked a little bit about you know what you guys are currently doing what do you expect the future to look like so we're, we're going to go with the assumption that we've got more adoption of this either through you guys or through other sources what does the future of devops and industrial automation look like yeah, I mean, this is where, like, for me, I've recently had some, like, realizations and been thinking about a lot, like, what is the trajectory that we're seeing? And I think it's exactly aligned with what we were just talking about. I think if you look at PLC programming 10 years ago and then 20 years ago, you know, really what you were seeing was, you know, uh, fleets of engineers you'd write bespoke code for each different PLC, you know, on an industrial floor. Um, you, you couldn't do any collaboration. You had no re reusability. Changes were really hard because you had to go modify each one individually. It was a hu hu hugely painful. What we've seen is like, you know, uh, the capability within different vendor platforms. So AOIs are great examples. The Siemens is library management, et cetera, to create libraries even within their software. So that's a first step. And as a result of that, we've seen people start to build out these sorts of centralized reusable libraries. And what you really get there are, are, are deep abstractions, right? The ability for people to say, hey, instead of, you know, you building out all this code yourself, you're going to use all these, these building blocks and build out your software that way. Um, and so I think as we see that transition from bespoke code to reusable code components and people building out solutions that way, we're going to see a totally different way of doing PLC programming, right? Because we really have these like now centralized teams, either you know, at a system integrator if they're large or advanced manufacturer, or even, you know, as I mentioned, smaller um, SIs and, and manufacturers as well will we'll build these out um, to, to kind of accelerate their code development. Um, and then to where I see us fitting into that is like, we're really just support, we're building the tools to kind of support, you know, that kind of transition. So having Git based source control, library management is something we're looking into, and then also deployment model. And so I actually was talking to, to Dave about this, we actually had a bunch of conversations about this in the past of like, really like, you know, what does that next generation of workflow look like? And so you can imagine a world where you're going through a digital transformation at a manufacturing site, let's say you have 150 PLCs, you know, even in the current world today, the way you do that migration is you go PLC to PLC because each PLC is the source of truth of your code. So you'd have to connect to it across your, your network, you know, and, and sometimes they're all, most of the time networks also segment it. So you're literally walking around a manufacturing site, you know, or, or multiple sites, you know, connecting the different PLCs. 
you're pulling your code off the PLC, then you, since you don't know the version of, of reusable code, if you have no reusable code, you have to check it out, copy and paste your code in, then you deploy it against the line, then you make sure that's working. And if it's working, you let it run and then like, hey, hopefully your SCADA is set up correctly, your monitoring steps correctly, because if something breaks, you know, you want to know about it, but you might not know. So like, that's the current state of the world, right? But what we can move towards is a world where like, hey, you know, you have complete visibility. So that's the code observability piece that we were talking mm -hmm. about, but all the code running on the manufacturing site, you have your reusable code, you can say, hey, we want to bump this library. So we're just do this optimization across, let's say, 20 of our PLCs. So you merge the code in, you bump the library change, you deploy remotely to each of those PLCs, you know, and then if you have automated testing, you already tested that code change. And most of the time, these, these changes are quite small. It's adding a sensor or something like that. Tested the code change automatically. It's supposed to run manual tests. You have that process and it runs every time testing the core systems there. So it's a better test. And then you've, le you've linked it with your observability. So if it breaks, it turns red and you capture it. Capture it. So if you think about that world of going PLC by PLC, that takes weeks or months. And, you know, I've heard of migrations of thousands of PLCs, you know, really big sites, you know, years to a migration that takes a week or two weeks and is very sensible and very safe and it can happen very fast. You know, that's actually like a force multiplier. Like that's an order of magnitude increase in productivity. So when we're talking about like, you know, ROI, you know, I always say it reduces to efficiency and, and uptime. We see both of those, but when we're talking about efficiency as one of the benefits there, you know, it's great to have, you know, 20, 10% increase in efficiency, but it's hard to measure that. If you're seeing a 10X efficiency, a project that took three months now takes two weeks. I mean, that's a totally different paradigm, right? That's so you're getting yeah. way more of your controls team. You can do a lot more as an organization. I think in a world where we're seeing controls engineers are working like 2X, you know, their, their, the time they should be working, people are working 60, 70 hours a week. You need that sort of solution in that space. So that's what I'm really excited about. I think it's going to totally change the way that controls is, is, is done. I think it's actually going to fundamentally change the way that people think about code and the way they do their job. And I think it's going to be a lot more fun as well. I think development's going to be a lot easier. So that's my yep. exciting vision. I think the best case scenario, and we want to just build tools to support that. that that's kind of where we fit in. No, for sure. I'm, I'm really curious to see, you know, how these tools change the landscape of uh, controls and manufacturing. And, you know, like one keyword that I kind of picked up on that's not seen in uh, manufacturing again, it's uh, test driven development, right? Which is like a methodology of how you develop essentially better code by building tests before you build the actual software to create the solution. And I think, again, in manufacturing, as you were saying, you for better or for worse kind of hope like things work and things don't break versus the other way around you could ensure that things work in a specific way and then you build code on top of that to make sure that again your equipment is not uh, uh I, I guess for worst case scenario it could be a safety issue but it could also just be breaking physical things it could be uh wasting product and again just costing you time and money at the end of the day for the business yeah, and some organizations do do test-driven development, but it's very expensive. <laughs> it's manual test, right? So it's actually funny because uh, one yeah. of the first conversations I had as I was trying to explore this space was um, basically this oil and gas company. This person says, we run a thousand manual tests for every change to our PLC. And we had, they showed a, a, I think they called a force chart or something like that, where it's basically just a unit test. Said, these inputs, we expect these outputs. And they'd send a team to a site, they'd shut it down for a week and they test every single you know potential outcome. If it broke once, they had to restart from the beginning. So like, that's a very costly yep. change. It is test driven. Yeah. <laughs> They're making sure to test it, but it's not, you know, it's not great. <laughs> it's an expensive test driven development, you know? And there's also lesser cases of that with, you know, safety and, and that sort of thing where you, you just do really heavy integration tests before you deploy any sort of change. And that's a huge burden on organizations. Um, so mm -hmm. yeah, I think it's either missing and that's a problem or it's there and it's very expensive, you know? Oh, for sure. I, I agree with that. So um, Adam brought up a really good point yesterday. If you guys listened to the previous episode, you would have heard us talk, talk about his machine design webinar. And so he, uh, the presenter yesterday asked him, Adam, something to the effect of, Adam, this sounds great. You know, how long does it take to onboard someone? And Adam, can, can you kind of tell, tell everyone listening how long it takes to onboard uh, to, to the Copia solution? Yeah, so for Copia and for a Git-based solution, it really is very, very fast. And so, um, you know, as I said, one of the things I really wanted to invest in, because I just saw project after project actually mm -hmm. literally die, you know, in a big corporate environment and take years because people didn't invest in migration properly from day one was like, let's build a solution that I can migrate you to quickly. So it's not a pain in the ass, right? Like, that's it. Mm -hmm. And also, as I mentioned, I'm lazy, so I don't want to do a migration. It's like boring work. So like, <laughs> you know, basically, you know, get as a solution, that's why it's a good entry point into this and enables people like slowly build up to a, to a kind of complete DevOps solution, you know, it integrates to the file system layer. 
So if you were working on a project today, and you download a copious solution, you know, you could open up a Git folder and it's just a folder in your directory and you could copy and paste your project that you're working on into the folder and you're migrate it. That's it. So, you know, and actually me saying it out loud is probably takes longer than the actual operation was. Um, so, you know, it's that easy. And then from there, you just open the folder and you, and you start, op you open the file and you start operating from there. So the migration is very, very fast. And then the standard workflow is two clicks, you know, so basically the standard workflow is you, or is three clicks. Let's say you open the, the file, you change it, and then you press commit to store locally. You can do as many commits as you want. And then you push to a remote server when you're done. So it handles offline and, 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 go, and is pushed to a remote server. So it's very straightforward. That's the standard Git workflow. And it gets you actually 80% of the way there towards having revision history, knowing who changed what code, like all of that stuff. Um, and then from there, you've, you've now entered into a world where you can start to approach more advanced solutions as it makes sense. And we see people just do it organically um, because it's like, oh yeah, sure. Now we can do code review easily because we can push this change. And so now we understand the change to a server as opposed to sending emails to each other or sitting next to each other, which is also hard to do in a, in a COVID world as we're getting more and more remote, right? So it enables that sort of collaborative workflow. So it's very straightforward. And we regularly onboard teams in, in 10 to 15 minutes. Typically, what we'll really do is book half hour and, and answer questions and that sort of thing. So you know, maybe it takes half an hour to, to really get going with this. But I think, you know, if, if you were moving through it quickly, you know, you could probably do it in, in 10 minutes and at least get a basic workflow going. And then over time, you can you can bring more folders in and more directory and, and build more process. But I think just to get going, it, it's pretty quick, which is which is one of the big big benefits yeah and i think i mean you know git has uh, has been fairly well documented you know again as we, we said it's not a new thing right and so there's a lot of documentation out there and as you said getting started i would say is fairly straightforward but it has a lot of capabilities under the hood right and it allows you to collaborate it allows you to track revisions it allows you to go back to certain pieces of code so there's there's quite a bit i would say like a suite of tools that you may not want to get into in the first like 10 minutes that you're working with it but there's certainly quite uh um quite a lot of capability so yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And one thing we've seen too is like also like why Git's a good solution is because it's so ubiquitous, people build solutions on top of it. So, you know, for example, like someone's like Jira integration, we haven't built out complete Jira integration yet. You know, uh, if you need it, you know, email me. Um, so we can prioritize. <laughs> but uh, that's my product manager hat. But like, um, you know, one of the things that we also were able to say to our, our customers as a result of that was like, hey, you know what, like Jira has a Git level integration. And so since we're Git under the hood, you can use, you know, uh, you know, gotcha. Jira, you know, you, you can use Jira with that. So we were able to get some solution there. And that's because people have invested a lot of time in, in tool chains around, around Git generally. Adam, I want to switch gears a little bit and ask you about your educational background. So I see that you did a degree in sociology. I'm wondering yeah. why that choice and what was the, I guess, the transition into software? How did you, I know, I mean, like went from there and get into software and what was that? transition like and has it helped has your degree helped you in your current life yeah you know i mean it was fun um i don't know uh, <laughs> so like for, <laughs> uh for me like um yeah so uh uh, I kind of, um, yeah, so I sociology undergrad. It's actually pretty much a heavy influence. So the name of the company is actually Copia, which is the Latin word for abundance, uh, which okay. is back to the uh, scarcity, you know, um, that sort of thing. But part of that was actually my professor, you know, had this concept of like, you know, and actually there's a lot of research on this in general that like abundance is really good for human groups, you know, like reduces conflict, enables people to collaborate more. It's like really like makes everything a little bit more copacetic. So like for me, that idea of like, how do we build a really abundant society or a really abundant future is like a really interesting question to me. So obviously this is Star Trek day. So we can, we can talk about this a little bit more than I would typically. Um, so I don't sound too crazy, but like for me, it's really like, okay, by the end of my life, like what do the systems that humans build on top of look like? You know what I mean? Like that's the exciting question to me. And it's like, oh, well, could we have a very, what, what does the future of manufacturing look like? Like, how do we build goods? Like, how do we supply goods to human beings? Like, how do we supply cities? You know, especially even like right now, we see all these supply chain issues. Like, how do we fix those? You know what I mean? Like, what are the actual literal technical tools that we need to build in order to do that? And I was actually talking to someone about this recently. Um, and she was saying to me, she's like, well, isn't someone just fixing that problem? And I was like, yeah, we're, we're, <laughs> we're fixing that problem. Like, that's what we're working on. You know what I mean? It doesn't just happen. Like, technology doesn't just happen. You know what I mean? So you need to build a vision of what the future looks like. And, you know, we talked about, like, abstraction, all that stuff. All that stuff was happening before Copia was around. You know what I mean? I think it's all stuff that is organic to some extent. And we're just supporting that sort of uh, continuance of the process. So to your question on sociology and how I got into this, I think for me, like, sociology actually led to technology. It led to that kind of bits and atom question for me of, like, well, what's actually really driving change? And to me, I have a very material 
materialist perspective. It's like, you know, fundamental changes in the basis of our economy and, and how things actually are built drive change and improvement in society overall. And so that's what, those are the problems I wanted to work on. And so paired with that was, you know, I got interested in software throughout college as well. So I was actually always working on side projects and I went and worked at a nonprofit and I was like, hey, you know, this is annoying that I have to go ask for money all the time and make an app that lets you donate money, <laughs> you know? Um, and then I just switched and got, got involved in tech and just started really liking it. So, and I, I basically was like writing an app every quarter, writing software all the time. And then graduated with a sociology degree. I was like, how do I get a job? <laughs> you know, I was like, oh, I can write code. So then <laughs> I got a job as a software engineer. Uh, so there's a little bit of that, that transition as well. So, what tools did you um, use to, to teach yourself? So sorry to sorry to have cut you off. Uh, like, how did you learn? I guess software because I think a lot of uh, people are still trying to. I would say on our side, get into like manufacturing, and they're maybe trying to figure out: is it better to go to college? Is it better to learn online, read a book? Like, what like what is your what are your thoughts on getting into the software world? Yeah, I mean, I think anyone with the controls engineering background um, can move into software. Like, I think there's similar enough professions that like you you could teach yourself. You know. Mm -hmm. um, especially with an engineering background, like you see a lot of engineers who aren't software engineers get jobs as software engineers. Boot camps can be useful, but I'm not like 100% on them. I'm um, going back for a master's degree can be fine, but it's often very expensive. Like I think people who are willing to be dedicated and some people need that sort of structure. So it depends on the sort of person you are. What I personally found useful, and this has always been for me, um, is like just like projects. So like the more that you're just like building out projects over time, um, the more that like you'll learn. So finding something that you want to see exist um, and then building out that solution, you know, is just like the best way to, to learn over time. And so for me, I was like building an app for a club that I was in that was helping us keep track of different members that we had. That was like literally my first project. And I was like, well, I'm storing a picture and letting people do chatting and letting people set up organizations. And like, that's actually already a pretty complex backend, right? So even a very simple project, you know, lets you start to build out those, those standard solutions. And then suddenly you've, you've built a whole thing and then you do it two or three or four times. And then you find an internship or, or a, a job contracting, and then you do that for a while, and then you find your first full time job. So I think it's easy to to is easy to segue in, but my my two cents would be like just find projects that are valuable and, and dig into that. And then obviously in the controls world, that could look like I'm going to write a tool that makes my life easier. You know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm going to build a competitor Copia or, or whatever. You know, <laughs> um, and then that could be uh, <laughs> that could be the project. So. Easier said than done, for sure. But no, it's it's definitely I think project based learning is uh, is important. I appreciate that insight, Dave. What what are your thoughts around that, or maybe any other questions? No, no, absolutely. I would agree with Adam. I think it's it's interesting to get his perspective on how he got started in software engineering, as it's different than the last uh, handful of people who we had, who we've had come on talk about a lot more formal education. And I would say that, especially in the software development space, and maybe even in the controls engineering space, you see a lot more kind of self-taught people uh, grow and succeed and get to places such as where Adam is because they have projects or they have needs and those needs kind of lead them down the, uh, lead, lead them down the path. So I think that, that that's very interesting. And so I, I do have a couple more questions for Adam, but Vlad, we have the, the first uh, sponsorship ad read uh, to, to do can wow. you give me some sort of like a uh, sound effect <laughs> like like they have in podcasts will, will, will it be you laughing vlad okay <laughs> <Yeah>. that'll <laughs> perfect we well, should have prepared I, for the sound effect better but yes no 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 i was thinking to myself in case anyone is wondering we absolutely did not prepare vlad for this intentionally so uh so this episode is brought to us uh, by Copia Automation. Uh, traditional operations for industrial manufacturing are becoming an area of opportunity in the digital transformation era. When one hour of production can be worth $250,000, every minute counts. And as of yet, technologies that have streamlined other industries haven't reached manufacturing. Copia Automation is building next generation tools for indus industrials, starting with Git-based source control solutions for PLCs. Copia views this as an easy first step that will enable organizations to streamline and scale, aiming to transform the world of PLCs from bespoke single purpose applications running on machine by machine basis to the ability to have reusable code and deploy changes much, much faster. Now, in case anyone thinks that those words sound very similar to, uh, to what Adam said earlier, that is probably because Adam uh, helped write this. So, so thank you very much, Adam. Th and thank you for coming on. Um, I do have, 
do have a couple of questions that we ask everyone. Um, I like to joke that this is our unsponsored Audible uh, clip because I'm going to now ask you for some book recommendations and Vlad's going to pull out his app and uh, download more books than he probably is prepared to. Uh, but do you have a couple of, of book recommendations uh, for everyone? Yeah, yeah, okay, here we go. So what I'm reading right now, I'm a big fan of, is Pragmatism and Other Writings by William James. So we talked a lot about, uh, you know, meeting, meeting reality where it's at, you know, pragmatists or empiricists. It's like how, how, how to, how, basically pragmatists ask the question of like, you're having a theoretical conversation about some topic, you know, how is it practical? <laughs> you know, it's kind of this way of like moving past navel gazing is, is this way of thinking about the world. Um, William James was a, a, a philosopher at Harvard, Harvard in the late 1800s. Um, who, who kind of built this, this school of thinking. So it's a very American uh, kind of uh, intellectual tradition. Uh, so very into pragmatism, very into pragmatism and other writings. The other book that I recommend that's more fun read, um, this one's a little heavy, uh, is uh, um, Player of Games by Ian Banks. That's I-A-I-N, Ian Banks. Um, it's part of a series called the Culture Series. Uh, and the premise of it is a uh, super futuristic society, you know, Star Trek's a few hundred years in the future. This is 10,000 years in the future where they're incredibly productive. So if you want anything, you, it's just built for you kind of automatically. So if you want to have your own island, you know, they have these ring worlds um, where they'll like actually just produce the land that you want. So basically people just have a life uh, filled with abundance. So speaking of the abundant uh, future. And then third, the third thing I'll say is obviously since it's Star Trek day, you know, people should always watch Star Trek. Um, you know, I'll always advocate for it every episode, um, you know, from the original series, Deep Space Nine, The Voyager, you know, I'm, I'm 100% into it. So, you know, anyone who cares about what the future might look like should, should double down on double down on some, some Star Trek, you know, especially today. So um, if you want to email me, <laughs> I'll send you my <laughs> five uh, episodes that will, will get you hooked on, on Star Trek. So <laughs> we'll take you up on that. I mean, I think we should share that in the description of the, of the video for sure. Yeah. Oh yes. Check, check the show notes for that. So thank you for that, Adam. I, I think you've uh, signed yourself up for a mm -hmm. bunch of completely off topic emails and, and we, we, all, we always appreciate those um, on this show. And then my, my other question for you is, you know, who do you help or, or who, or which people should reach out to you? Yeah. I mean, anyone who's interested in this space, like if you want to introduce these, these solutions to your organization, you know, obviously reach out and we're happy to have a, you know, demo free trial, that sort of thing. But also, you know, people who are generally interested in this space, like, you know, I, I often say in this little quiche, but like we, we build with the market. So, you know, we, we didn't like magically, you know, come into the space. I think there's actually a lot of, where a lot of like, you know, Silicon Valley tech, you know, startups, like kind of mess up as they, they come in, like, you know, start talking to people and they're like, this is how the world should be. You know, we came in this, uh, and we we're just like, Hey, what, what's happening? We just talked to a bunch of people. We've probably talked to hundreds of controls engineers at this point, you know, about like, Hey, what issues are you running into? What solutions do you want? And that's caused us to kind of compose these sets of solutions and worldview. So I'm always down to have a conversation, you know, and, and talk about some of these things. So if you have feedback, if you think I'm a complete idiot, uh, please tell me. I'm always open to that as well. You know, I, I often say like I, I can take a punch, but it doesn't mean I won't be bruised the next day. So like, you know, I'm happy to, to hear why what we're doing is dumb. But if you also think it's smart, uh, it's interesting, you know, happy to chat with you. Um, and then we are we are actually hiring too um, on the on the sales side. So you know if you happen to be a salesperson, you're on this call um, and you're and you're looking to, to move into a new role. You know also feel free to chat with us. Or if you're someone with a controls background, but you know a couple of years software engineering experience, you know we're, we're hiring engineers as well, and we, we'd love to you know hire people in. So you know feel free to feel free to chat if if that's if that's your your flavor as well. So you know uh, basically we're we're pretty much open. So so feel free to to, to reach out. Um, but definitely, if you want a free trial, uh, reach out. <laughs> and I want to mention, I guess, because, you know, some folks or some engineers would prefer to just like, you know, go on your website, which is copia.io, and you can essentially get a free trial without speaking to anyone. You know, so if you're maybe shy or unwilling to have any longer conversation, you can just try out the demo and it's uh, it's completely open. So you should be able to go on the website to register and um, get right on it, right? Like see if it, yep. if it works for your organization, for you and whatnot. Yeah. This is a new feature, but yes, we now have an app free trial. So if you if you sign up for free trial through the website, we'll email you with a link and then you can go ahead and, and get a free trial going. Um, so you don't have to talk to anyone. <laughs> awesome. Appreciate it, Adam. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. No, no. Perfect. Thank you very much, Adam. Vlad, do you have any uh, last comments but before no, we sign No, I do off? not. I do not. Perfect. Thanks again, Adam. Yes. All right. Awesome. Thank you, Adam.
Thank you, everyone. Thanks so this is for having me. Thanks, everybody, thank for this listening is... in. Yes, th right, thank you, everyone. Uh, we'll see everyone.